with John, followed by Ian, followed by Anand, okay. and then Jim and Jake. Make sense? Yep. All right, fantastic. So you're welcome to start when you're ready. So, uh, I thought I was going to, uh, like, John uh, wanted to go you're first. John. Oh, sorry. I'm you're not sorry. who I thought you were. Okay. All right, John, are you ready? Oh, you, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're welcome to use the handheld or the podium, whatever makes you more comfortable. Oh, well, I'm easy. All right. Oh, sorry, can I say one more thing? Sure. So I'm, I'm the timekeeper, and so it's, it's not, please don't take offense, I'll just say fine, and my expectation is that you bring to six steps back and time well, I'm uh, excited about vision, right? Because we create reality. We manifest what we want to be true by the things that we speak. We build teams around it. And then we find tribes of people like the R-Chain community to actually create those things and make them reality. So a lot of what I focus on is not what's happening with the test net today or with the launch of the platform in three months, but where are we gonna be in 30 years? Like, what does blockchain look like when it's the new cloud? What does blockchain look like when it's the new internet? You know, how does Jarvis and Iron Man actually happen? Because it's not just a voice app, Amazon Alexa, it's not just an augmented reality app on your glasses. It's way more complex than that. It's very advanced artificial intelligence, and obviously you have to have the trust, authenticity, to actually build that in an ecosystem like the blockchain. So, I'm the CEO of a company called WOMVI, stands for We Magnify Voice for Attention and Influence. And we started off building a B2B SaaS platform to put audio content on Amazon Alexa, then on Google Assistant and other platforms. As we started to think about the future of voice, we realized that if we could build our entire company in the ecosystem of blockchain, within five or 10 years, we can be a completely uh, autonomous organization. Our software company can run itself with very little human oversight by doing the smart contracts. Then we start thinking about smart cities, start meeting with different world leaders. Like, how can you run a city with advanced machine learning inside the blockchain and could voice be the operating system, the interface that's frictionless? Because the question is, are we really gonna run cities and run businesses on a cell phone with our fingers or on a desktop computer? Or does it make more sense to make decisions that are pre-vetted, uh, pre right? These, these strings of smart contracts, this kind of uh, algorithm of if this, then that, where everybody's pre-approved these things, and then you can launch businesses. Like, I'll give you a really simple one that I think will happen uh, in much less than 30 years. Maybe this will happen in the next couple of years. In the future, when you have an idea, and you think, oh, great idea, and you say to Amazon Alexa, you say, hey, Siri, or you say, hey, Google, um, I have a great idea. Go on to GoDaddy and find out if great idea, it, .com is available. And, and it says, no, sorry, but super great idea, .com is available. Okay, well then go ahead and check all the social media handles and find out if the at symbol is available for that as well. Yes, the at symbol is available everywhere. Okay, go ahead and get me the social media handles, buy the domain with my credit card on file, and then fill out the standard website template and pull up my TV screen right now. And in 23 seconds, it's all done. You own the domain, and your social media handles are done. You look at the site, you start telling it to pull a photo from your phone and to grab this YouTube video you just watched, and you literally build out the entire website on Squarespace or on Wix, right there with your voice. You then say, okay, I need to invite people to my party so I can launch my great idea company. And you say, launch an Eventbrite page. And on the Eventbrite page, I want you to invite every single person by text that lives within 50 miles. And anybody outside of 50 miles, invite them by email. And the Eventbrite page is live, the invites go out, and your event is already sold out. All happens within five minutes. That's the future that can happen. Now, will it be on Eventbrite, Wix, Squarespace, and GoDaddy? Only if they turn toward blockchain as the basis of their technology, or other competitors will take their space. But companies like that will figure out how to do these things, leveraging machine learning built in the blockchain, I believe using voice as the operating system. And so that's the future that I am both excited about and trying to build. So thanks for your time. And I don't know if I have time for a question or two. Yeah, 
Okay, so does anybody have a question about this space? Because I learn when I get <laughs> when people ask me questions. Are there any specific things that you're trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, our primary focus is getting content. So that is audiobooks, uh, podcast content, music content, and business content on Amazon Alexa through Alexa Skills, on Google Assistant, Google Home, Apple Pod, Apple Siri, Samsung Bixby, Microsoft Cortana. So that's our first pursuit. Then we have other products that are all around voice, things like how do you develop, manage, run, and lead a city using your voice, using our software built on the blockchain. So what we have live right now is our B2B SaaS product that is specific to Amazon Alexa flash briefings. What we're working on is our second version, which includes Google Analytics, sorry, uh, Google Assistant, and Microsoft Cortana, and we'll have analytics and monetization so that people can monetize their content on Alexa or Google by uh, selling things on Google Play or selling things to the Amazon store. So that's our first step, and then we have massive vision, and that's why I've built a very large tech team around me. So John Weesey is our CTO, our other two technical partners are CTO level guys, and then we have a large team of technical talent that are specialists around them. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, any, anything else come to mind? Yes. Sure. Well, I'll just say this, you know, right now people in cities are trying to figure out how they can leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence to automate things. Then they're saying, is blockchain real yet or do I have to wait a long time before I can actually go after this? It will be one day, but is it now? My, my hope is that they can wrap their heads around taking these two technologies and having voice as the interface. In 30 years, I do believe that mayors and governors will be, and city council people, will have five or 5,005 different smart contracts that help them run their city. And when they want something done, they've already had all the lawyers pre-approved, they've had their staff pre-approved, they've had the votes already made, and when they want something done, they speak it to the machine, and instead of it taking weeks or a year to have happen, it is instantaneous, and that change or that policy goes into effect immediately because all of the infrastructure has been laid out in terms of the machine learning doing a lot of our blocking and tackling, rolling up our sleeves and doing the, the tactical work of it all inside the blockchain so it's authenticated, it's trustworthy, it's safe, it's secure, and in my opinion, I think voice is the most frictionless way for us to function with technology until and if we have glasses that can read our eyeballs and know what we're thinking. So until that happens, we're probably gonna create things with our voice. And the last thing I'll say, unless there's another question, is there's a lot of dystopic media and movies and entertainment out there, right? Terminator, Blade Runner, Black Mirror, Electric Dreams make it very easy for the population out there to be afraid of technology. But we can't forget the things that Star Trek and the Jetsons <laughs> laid out as possibilities and how close we've come to actually realizing and manifesting those imaginative ideas. And it is people like you in this room and people like you that are watching online, either live now or the archive, it is this community that can create a more utopic reality for humanity because everything that man has ever created has one way or another ended up helping people. We can be afraid of it, but if we just are courageous and we grab a hold of these things and we allow ourselves to have vision for how it can help people, bring people together, help people collaborate, help solve systematic poverty, then these things can actually happen. And there's a lot of great people like all of you that are working on this. And so I'm glad to be working with you in this environment by your side. I think I'm done. Thank you so much. All right, next we have John. John. Here you go, my friend. All right. So he's the voice, and he needs me to belt it. <laughs> I don't know how good brain, but pretty good. 
So 30 plus years engineering, seems like I've done a lot of different things. It always comes down to breaking the problems down to individual components. And I haven't seen a lot of advancement, to tell you the truth, in a lot of areas. One of those areas is how do we design things? You know, and your question was great. I think it was back here of, okay, how do we do that? Okay, machine learning is not there yet to do everything we want to do. Build me a new device that has this spec, does this, um, put the marketing team out there, all that. So you have to think in a hybrid model in that situation. There will be people involved. It won't always be all voice. There will be other UI, UX. You'll probably want to see a, a big a picture of a schematic of what this looks like. But think about the building blocks and of all the things. Think about the building blocks of just building a, a business and then going into operations mode where you're actually running the business. So Ian talked about the sort of startup mode. You know, building a website, getting a corporation, finding out about that area. So in that loop and on that startup phase, there may be go hire three consultants and the business is uh, wine and maybe a particular segment of wine. Find me the experts out there that know how to market and sell that. Go hire those people off of work, uh, Upworks or other consulting sites and have them, re you know, and here's, and I want them, you know, to understand my business and give me the advice how to set it up. Set up your corporation. Pretty easy stuff. But you spend hours doing it. We just sent hours to set up a LLC, uh, a C Corp, you know, how does all these things work, meeting after meeting. Even though it was pretty fast, it, it isn't fast. It takes a couple weeks to get this stuff done. It should be done in a matter of, you know, half an hour or so with someone, you know, asking questions about intelligent questions about what you want to do to give you the right kind of structure for your corporation. So these things can be automated, but there probably is some human interaction in those loops. So being able to build a set of smart contracts as a collection of building blocks to be able to put those pieces together to make uh, the Alexa, you know, not just about how much time is left on my timer, what the weather is, or what the time in Rome is. Those are nice things, okay? My wife likes to think, tell me a joke or whatever, right? You know, but, the, you know, we need to take it up a notch, a big notch. So our dream is to build automation in this whole thing. Very first phase is distributing lots of content so one of the problems we have is how do we operate in the world where everything is commoditized, music has been commoditized, um, books have been commoditized, all that content. And a lot of times you don't want all the content, and maybe you want a summary of it. So how do you get that content onto these devices? So we think of us as pretty easy content management for voice devices, okay? these smart devices, and they're in an early stage, but we're building on that to go where we want to go, and that's why we want to build into it the, the next generation of monetization, and where monetization isn't just you get monetized uh, uh, if you're selling a product. You get monetized through the whole cycle. The creator does, the editor does, the the person who wrote the content, not just you, you've uh, put some great content up on Facebook and they monetize it for themselves. So there's this new version of monetization that really takes uh, and places all the stakeholders in a value proposition with the worth of that content. So there's some, uh, there's some models out there right now they're not as advanced, but we want to bring monetization to our chain as one of the first projects we're going to do so we can monetize products that have traditionally not been monetized easily to the value stakeholders, okay? A lot of the value stakeholders really aren't valued. 
Um, so that's one of the sort of early side of things, and that offers a lot of opportunities because there's not anyone providing a content management system to be on all these voice devices out there right now from Alexa, you know, Google, uh, you know, when they have an API, Siri, those kinds of players. So right now you have to hire a programmer for each one of them. Yeah, they're similar, but it's a programming exercise. Why should it be a programming exercise? It should be, you know, hey, I got content, put it on, you know, get the levels right. We've got audio people that know how to do all that, but we'll automate it all. But our dream is much bigger. These smart contracts, imagine a, a business that you're running, that business I was talking about for wine. There's gotta be someone in your HR department. How do you, how do you uh, hire people, you know, to get the work done? The, the parts that machine le learning, not able to do at this point. Very narrow machine learning right now. So basically we wanna be able to hybridize the whole system with human workers and uh, computing workers in smart contracts. And uh, smart cities is where we're headed. Um, and uh, you know, that has IOT, uh, you know, a lot of micro payments in the, on the way. So there's a lot of, a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Our roadmap is, is, is you know, the monetization piece first, and then the smart contracts to build real businesses and operate those businesses by breaking down the structures of business. They're pretty much all the same. You gotta, you gotta have something that runs it. You gotta have the HR department. You have to have a product, whether you're buying it or whether you're, you're uh, developing it with an R&D team. All those things being broken down into uh, a lot of smart contracts that does all the hiring and firing and all that. Um, and uh, basically the marketing and sales side of it too. So that's, uh, that's our grand vision. It's got a lot of, a lot of work and uh, we'll be uh, hiring here soon. <laughs> What's your organization? What's that? What's your company? WMB.AI. And I'm John. Any questions or anything? Yes. Yes. Um, I also appreciate the, uh, I guess, security implications that that might have. For example, the example of the city council person um, queuing a series of events uh, with her voice. Yeah, um, security is always an issue, and that's that's one of the issues that you know. Of course, the data has to flow. It's the, really the data flow that you're trying to secure. Um, We'll be adding, you know, all the standard encryption stuff for all of our back end and everything when it hits our stuff, our platform. Um, but voice is frictionless. So think about it. You know, before the printing press, you know, we communicated mostly through voice because people didn't know how to read and write all, you know, at that point. I mean, there was a very few and they were at the top of the pyramid of, of running things. You know, you had your... You know, people you know, look at the church. The church, you know, were run by those who could read and write the Bible. And everybody else just took it as fact, whatever they said. They couldn't read it. They couldn't even check on it. But our, our conversations of being able to do things through our voice is until we have, you know, a complete neural interface, which is probably a ways off, but they're working on it, uh, which is a little scary too. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be the first person. But voice is how we get things done, how why we have meetings and why we talk to each other and get each other's opinion. Why shouldn't it be more effortless when we're trying to do a lot of the task in our life? Right now, those platforms like Alexa and Google are very simple, they're not very advanced. But what we're trying to do is take it all to the next level. And we believe that a scalable system like our chain and the way they're thinking is a good foundation to build on. And I, I imagine being able someday, having an idea, I'm driving down to LA 
from San Francisco and maybe even start a company or start a project or a prototype. And so those are the kinds of things we're dreaming about right now. They're pretty big. Can you hear me? Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Wambai, what a vision, wasn't it? Uh, I also appreciate uh, what he said about our obsession with dystopia. I think the only difference between dystopian technology and utopian technology is the blockchain. So I think if you're working with any technology in the blockchain space uh, in trying to make it decentralized, you're definitely going the Jetsons way and not Black Mirror. So. Uh, Hi, I'm Anand. I'm with Lendroid. I'm, I want to talk to you about uh, a force uh, which makes the financial world go round and by extension affects everybody on the planet. That force is credit. It's often misunderstood and uh, grossly underestimated. We believe that credit is a force for good and at its best it can be a lifeline, and uh, when you're in the business of creating value for the community, it can insulate you from all outside pressures and just let you get on with your job. Lendroid is a non-custodial credit engine which enables financial services on the blockchain. That's what we're about. Now, conventional systems of credit have been around for millennia. Uh, they've, they have... Uh, extraordinarily complex supporting systems uh, like credit scoring and, uh, and a lot of other things. But they have also evolved into highly centralized, very localized and very opinionated systems. And they've, been, they've evolved in a direction that uh, favors those people who have a sway over the system. But on the blockchain, it's still nascent and I think we have a chance to get it right. To make credit truly global and accessible to everybody, to make it trust independent, and finally to make it unopinionated. That's what we are about. Now, uh, uh, our original vision was to enable margin on the blockchain. So we had, uh, uh, we called ourselves the uh, margin trading protocol of the blockchain. But then we realized to enable margin would require the sort of infrastructure the blockchain had never seen before. At that point, we had two choices in front of us. One, wait for the entire ecosystem to evolve. Or two, start building towards that ecosystem. Start building towards that infrastructure, which is, which is kind of what we did. So uh, if you take a look at our roadmap on lendroid.com, we've uh, split it into broad pillars. We've got collateralized loans, auction markets, margin trading, and governance. Our roadmap is modular and non-linear. Why non-linear? Because, well, the ecosystem doesn't evolve in a straight line. It branches out into weird and interesting directions. And we wanted to make the best use of technology available today. And why modular? For similar reasons. Because we don't want to wait until the entire protocol is created for someone to be able to use it. We want to build components which are complete in themselves, which can be used right now. And uh, one of the things that we've built already, which is already on uh, testnet, is Reloaner. Reloaner is a secondary market for DAI loans, the DAI stable currency. Currently, what you can do with uh, DAI, well, until we came along, is that you can hold it. That's all you could do with it. What we've done is created a secondary market for it, where uh, if you have DAI, you can lend it out for an interest. And if you don't have DAI, you can borrow it instead of trying to buy it outright. So this is the first use case uh, on the Lendroid uh, protocol. There's a lot more coming up. If you take a look at our roadmap, each of the elements of our roadmap, whether it is uh, 
creating auction buckets or enabling uh, 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 margin trading in bits and pieces, or a very unique Lendroid concept called the Wrangler, who basically monitors the loan health throughout. Uh, all of these are uh, very complete in themselves, which will become products by themselves, use cases. So that's what we're about. So please check us out on lendroid.com. There's something else I wanted to talk about. Uh, listen, Greg said uh, this morning, it, it's a very powerful word, and especially relevant to the blockchain community. I believe there's a lot of talking that goes on within uh, communities in the blockchain, but not enough listening. Case can be made for that. It struck me this morning when I entered the Archain conference. We are fresh off a series of uh, Ethereum-based events. Uh, uh, call it DevCon, uh, one in Denver, one in Bangalore, East India, and so on and so forth. I realized that uh, I hardly knew anybody here. There were about 300 people in the room, and uh, I didn't know anybody here. The reason is because we tend to be very uh, closed in within our communities. And uh, there's, there isn't enough of an exchange of ideas uh, between each other. And this half day of listening was incredibly useful, not just for me uh, as an individual, but also as a project. I mean, we've been uh, uh, you know, spitballing about uh, a lot of scaling solutions, state channels, or creating a plasma layer on top of uh, Lendroid. But uh, the R-Chain blockchain uh, uh, yeah, uh, contains incredible promise. The fact that uh, you know, blocks are not serialized unless they have a dependency on each other. The, the uh, fact that you can you know, uh, run parallel blocks at the same time, all of those solve the scaling solution, potentially. Uh, they are of incredible interest. And uh, who knows uh, how many other projects there are out there, how many other ideas there are out there, which we haven't been able to explore simply because we've been so inward focused. So, uh, so this is one of the things uh, uh, you know, I really loved about uh, this particular session of today. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening to a lot more of you. Thank you. Any questions? Any, yeah. Anybody want to? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you ensure that? Well, it's completely decentralized, isn't it? There is no way in which we could we could even introduce bias uh, on top of a decentralized platform. So, so there's no process for filtering or gapping. If anybody who comes onto the platform, they can. They can. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's the dream. Uh, right now. Uh, as with any other crypto lending platforms or any other platforms on crypto which deal with uh, financial services, they are heavily collateralized. If you want to get a loan, you have to put in a lot of collateral. The idea is to uh, create very interesting uh, gamified projects which will uh, invite a lot of liquidity into the system. The more players there are, the more liquidity there is. The more money there is, the easier it is to uh, get loans. That's, that's sort of what we're going for. Also, micro loans also. Yeah. See, right now you can't. Not just micro loans. We're also talking about uh, more long-term loans. Currently, uh, say if you want to uh, take a crypto loan, you ideally do it for say uh, the purpose of trading, or for something short-term. Uh, even uh, a month is a is a huge time period as far as crypto is concerned. We are trying to build systems wherein you can get. Uh, uh, loans for, say, a car loan or to buy a house, which can go on not just for a month or two, but for years together, maybe a decade. So durable systems which uh, ensure that the lender's interests are protected, as well as you know, uh, give access to lo uh, loans to anybody that needs it. In two ways. Uh, see, one is uh, obviously uh, every loan is collateralized, right? So whenever the loan health dips or if it uh, goes beyond uh, a certain level, the collateral is liquidated and the lender is uh, paid back. So he, his interests are always uh, protected. The other way is that uh, 
Traditionally, in uh, a lot of financial systems, there are clearinghouse services or margin account monitoring services, where uh, a central authority monitors your account. If it goes too low, he gives you a call, which is called a margin call. But you can't do that in crypto if you want to truly really decentralize. So what we've done is we've created uh, incentivized off-chain players, like a Wrangler. So uh, you can be a Wrangler today. Uh, you know, uh, we've got... Uh, uh, scripts that you can run, which can make you a wrangler today. Uh, you can offer services that, uh, okay, I will monitor this person's account. If it goes too low, I will warn him. I'll ask him to top up that account. I will help the lender liquidate the collateral, if that's what it takes. So uh, when we build an ecosystem of off-chain players like that, they work towards the health of the ecosystem. And it benefits them also in turn. So in two ways, the interests of all the participants are protected. Thank you. Thing that I'm involved with in the digital life community in our chain is cooperation at scale and um, uh, the uh, you know our chain yeah. is here to enable cooperation at scale um, but I've been uh, involved in research and development in group systems uh, since uh, the mid-70s, uh, experimentation and control uh, and fields trials and the study of collective intelligence and been involved in many communities over the years that grow to a certain point and then they become dysfunctional and die. And, uh, you know, it's a major problem in my mind uh, I know what it takes to be a catalyst in, you know, in uh, uh, these kinds of systems, uh, but that requires social intelligence, and I don't have any. But <laughs> uh, so a lot of what I, I do ends up being uh, academic. Um, but uh, the basic uh, problem is. F finding the chaotic path, uh, the sweet sp spot of generative immersion between where the system does not become dysfunctional and chaotic and it is not limited by central control that can't scale. Um, and um, there are some isolated examples of collaborations that have worked like Wikipedia, um, but uh, uh, it's rare and uh, we can't expect that is going to happen automatically. Um, the, uh, uh, what we're look, looking at is uh, uh, a system that needs to be user-centric. And uh, decentralized in an organized way. Um, uh, and distributed, uh, creating a holographic structure. Um, and uh, it, you know, the research shows that in order to do that, what we need to do is operate in small, well-connected teams, distributing power among the teams and uh, following the successful patterns of decentralized organization. And I don't have time to go over these, but it starts off with being user-centric, the member of our chain has to be the important thing in our mind and we have to support and empower 
the members. And then the, gr the greatest increase in collective intelligence happens peer-to-peer. -peer. We need to connect people and get the peer-to-peer -peer connections and then empower the teams that emerge um, and follow these patterns on every level of organization. Um, it's a great video. They did a, uh, the HUM did a, a presentation for our chain. Check out the vi video. Um, what I've tried to do is embody um, these patterns into a series of, of norms. Um, you know, we work, pl play, and learn together. I mean, things are changing so fast, and we have to learn new things every day. And we're bringing people into a whole new culture. You know, we're going from wage slavery to a gifting economy. And, uh, uh, you know, we're uh, paying each other and ourselves, you know, in, in the bounty system in a scalable manner, you know, using you know, an attack-resistant trust metric, metric, metric. And, uh, uh, you know, we help each other to, you know, to learn to guide our, themselves. They don't, people aren't used to, people are used to being told what to do. You know, they don't know how to guide themselves. And, um, you know, and they, and, uh, they need to learn to seek guidance and, uh, working in small connected teams is the important thing. It turns out the ideal team size is 4.5 people. And if you have more than five, or if you have five or more, the chances are you'll have two people that can't work together. Okay, and you either have to keep the team smaller or make sure, make the people that can't work together, put them in a situation where they don't have to. <laughs> the, um, um, uh, and we add value wherever we can with the group memory. Uh, we work out loud so that, you know, uh, we, we know what others are doing. We can coordinate because they're uh, being, uh, 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 you know, they're, uh, we, uh, uh, we're communicating. We know what they're doing and we have links between the teams so the teams can gain consent across teams which can create consent across the organization. Um, uh, we have fun, okay? Einstein said uh, every successful endeavor he was in was had three things, and I'm not sure this is the right example to bring up, but it was uh, uh, diligence, uh, frivolity, and keeping your mouth shut, which <laughs> Which is, you know, there has to be privacy. I mean, if everybody is looking at everything you're doing in a small group, it's just going to create chaos. You know, you have to, you work things out peer to peer, small groups, larger groups, and these breakout sessions and things when you, you know, if you go two by two and then go together into four and then you go to eight, we've shown in our research that this is how collective intelligence emerges. It's not by giving the problem to everybody and taking a vote. It's, you know, you get the worst solution in that case. <laughs> okay, we express our concerns. We express appreciation. We express consent. Uh, we object when something is not safe enough to try or not in line with our objectives. We experiment, we love experiment. We say, okay, try it, but you know, there's limits. We evaluate the effectiveness of our activities and consider alternatives. Uh, the team formation process, people have to know what to do in order to come together and make a team and integrate into the organization. Um, and um, uh, we need facilitators and catalysts. And this is, you know, people need to learn how to, you know, people that have social intelligence need to, uh, 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 embody these decentralized behaviors and disposition, which is, this is from the, the starfish and the spider. A starfish, you cut off an arm, it grows back, okay. 
you have a much more resilient organization, a, a sociocratic polyarchy where there's really no top. It's a, a, can, it's a, a organization that can grow and evolve and scale. Um, and uh, I don't know how much time we have. And putting the user in control, it means a self-sovereign user interface, not their interface, but your interface. And organizing your information resources in a way that you can use them effectively and that you can have, you know, information from all different data sources, you know, uh, for yourself and for your teams and for organizations that uh, can be accessed all the same way in easy applications and uh, can, uh, can be reconfigured, you know, today from GitHub and the bounty system to our chain tomorrow because, you know, the, the, the graph structure corresponds to the, to the structure of data on our, that we'll have on our chain. Um, and this is what we're doing uh, here. And then, you know, on a more global scale in Digital Life Collective, uh, we're building a, uh, a decentralized tech ecosystem map with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, where you can do all kinds of filtering and searching. You can see, find out who's doing what and who's connected. Um, and then uh, also the social ledger, which will be my next talk. The social ledger is out there, <laughs> and it will be on our chain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Got it? Oh, here we go. I'll take this. Jake? Can I ask a question? What about this map? Is this map available? Uh, yes. Um, and uh, I've had... Uh, our chain is not on it yet. Uh, there's someone in the bounty system who's committed to do it. I don't know if he's going to do it. Uh, I don't remember the issue number, but um, uh, we uh, should get our chain on there. A lot of the projects have uh, very nice uh, presentations uh, connected to the map. Um, it's, uh, it's on Kumu right now. We want to get it onto our chain. Um, uh, I can... Uh, 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 if you go to diglife.com, D-I-G-L-I-F-E.com, um, you should be able to find the map pretty easily. All right. well, hi, everybody. I'm Jake. Uh, and I work for Drone Energy, which is basically an energy-focused Bitcoin mining company. Um, and I'd like to show you guys our mine, because indeed, this is a talk that's a little bit about mining and a little bit about our chain. So, I'll just pull up our website. Please excuse the delay. There we go. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right, uh, where's our website, so, uh, oh geez, all right, here we go, courage, <laughs> yep, yep got to use the keys, O-N-E-E-N-E-R-G, well, thank you, <laughs> there. All right, that, that it is, that it is. So I really, uh, if you look at our website, you can see us, but mostly I want to show you guys our mind because um, this is a talk about tokenizing the output of Bitcoin mines using our chain and decentralizing our chain validators. 
So we built mines in shipping containers. Um, this is you know, our first little mine. It consumes 330 kilowatts, and uh, we pay far too much for the electricity. It's profitable, but it's not super profitable. Um, so what could we do to improve that situation? Well, the next mine is going on top of a mountain in Pennsylvania and it's going to consume natural gas. So basically, that's an example of tapping into stranded energy. Um, now, the next step, though, is all of the places where we are drilling for oil and literally burning the natural gas because we can't do anything with it. Um, this is actually a common industry practice and you know, we, we see an opportunity there. But a mine is really capital intensive and, uh, how can I put this? Dealing with the output of the mine, that is the Bitcoin, can get cumbersome absent a blockchain-based solution. So, in short, what's the idea here? We create an R-Chain smart contract that has a token that requires the user to store a Bitcoin address. Okay, so if you own 10 of these tokens called Citadel tokens, um, you also store your Bitcoin address. If there's only 100 of these Citadel tokens for the mine, you get 10% of its output after energy costs. Um, the other kind of cool thing is that a mine has to be connected to the internet. You know, it, it needs to report back its Bitcoin mining information to the mining pool. But that also means is that we could put a computer in there. One thing I've kind of confirmed over the last couple of days is that a low stakes validator for our chain can totally go in a shipping container. Um, it has all the connectivity needed uh, and it would do just fine. In fact, probably even a middle stakes one would be okay too. So, this is the idea. You take the output of the mine as recorded by the pool and you tokenize that. Now, unfortunately, we can't make the Bitcoin blockchain and the R-Chain blockchain just like suddenly play nice together and make this a trustless thing. That's not really going to work out. But what we can do is build a very simple daemon that reads the state of the smart contract. So like, who has what tokens, right? So you have six, you have 10, you have four, you have three, and so on. And pays out proportionally according to ownership. Now, every mine is its own economic entity. It's different from every other mine. The, the equipment can be different, the energy source can be different. And so the right way to do this is not to have just one Citadel token, but one Citadel token for every mine that you create. Okay, and this design basically allows you to go out and use the lowest cost energy that in many cases is literally being wasted um, anywhere. Because you can put a shipping container just about anywhere, provided that you can get an internet access. And we've done some really cool things with uh, wireless ISPs. So we have, haven't had any problem getting these things connected. Um, so that, that's basically the idea, is this Citadel token, which allows, and this is a part, it's a bit of a gray area. Not sure yet if it's fractional ownership of the mine or fractional ownership of the mine's output kind of trying to clarify that. Um, but with that, I guess I'm going to kind of leave it to any of you if you have any questions about this uh, or any reactions to it. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, definitely think about diversifying the energy inputs. The, the stranded natural gas is just probably the low-hanging fruit at the moment. Why is that? 
Um, because it, it works out to a very low cost and nobody's like, so in, in the case of this, oh, we're gonna put a mine on top of a mountain. Well, they have a gas well on top of a mountain, but they don't have anybody using that gas and to build a pipeline down the mountain would cost far too much. So in the end, our, the energy cost ends up being extremely low. But to answer your question, yeah, we're absolutely, you know, any low cost energy is, is interesting, of course. Uh, let's see, I believe that I just went over it. So, uh, you'll have to excuse me being very generic, right? Uh, $10 million in yields about $1 million out per month, and then you have to adjust for difficulty and price changes. So actually, like, if we were to create a document trying to give more information on that, it would be, uh, we, we have done that, and uh, what can I say? It definitely involves a lot of things that are dependent on, say, the future price of Bitcoin, the difficulty on the network. Um, so you make, you make your best effort at estimating those things, but it's always an estimate. Anybody else? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, a generator. Right, right. Yeah. So, why can that energy not just be the grid? Why, why is, is it a mess? Oh, you, end up, you just end up with a much lower cost. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, because that, so that gas has an extremely low value because it's extremely expensive to take to market. Exactly. So you're, you're taking, you know, it, I, I think it, probably the best example is a situation where it's being burned off, um, something that is literally waste, and you turn it into value. Um, but the mountain situation is a good one too because it's unusable as it is, just due to its location. That's such a great question, thank you. Okay, so the reason why you need a token for this is because it enables you to create a document that describes the mine, judge people's interest, and allow them to understand. So each, each location for a mine is going to have its own risk profile, its own equipment needs, and so on. And basically, it allows you to give to your consumer who like, let's compare to like cloud mining for a second, right? Where you're just buying, they just tell you that you're buying hash rate and nothing else. Um, in this case, you're buying into the entire mine for the lifetime of the mine. And you use a token basically to coordinate the payout. So, uh, because you're assuming that it's gonna be a large number of people um, you use that token. It's also highly repeatable. So you do this once and do well with it. You do another one and another one and another one. And people know that, you know, this setup produces a good return. Another weird thing, and we, we don't actually know about this next part. What happens when you create a token backed by a weekly or monthly Bitcoin payment? Like, <laughs> that's, um, I would really like to find out. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have a lot of fun at Drone. Where are you based on? Buffalo. 